Thank you very much, uh, Satu Santala, Fintarp, um, distinguished members of the audience. Uh, Satu indeed was a person with whom I had a lot of interaction. One of my favorite persons at the World Bank that I interacted with, Satu, thank you very much for the very, very generous introduction. Um, and also, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be back in Helsinki, a country that, as a researcher, I first actually interacted years ago. And during my um, years at the World Bank, uh, there was a lot of interaction with Finland because among Finland must have been among two, three countries with which the World Bank had the most interaction in terms of research. Um, in terms of research grants, research money, research interests. And some of the tribute for that really also goes to wider because it has become over the years such a visible and prominent player in the space of global development uh, policy. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. you know, every time I hear um, a generous introduction like Satu's, uh, my mind drifts back to a very embarrassing generous introduction very early in my career. I had just finished my PhD when my mother wanted me to speak at a school run by an NGO that my mother liked a lot in Calcutta. So I went to give a talk there. I had just out of my graduate school. The trouble started when we were entering the hall and my mother told the principal that I'm a very famous economist. <laughs> uh, and then with my mother sitting in the front row, the principal had no choice. He introduced me as a very famous economist. And then to my complete bafflement, he went on and on about that, about me, about my achievements, which was zero, absolutely. And I gradually realized what had happened. He had forgotten my name. <laughs> and he was trying to kill time to remember. He could not remember, he turned to me and after that flowery introduction said, excuse me, sir, what is your name? <laughs> it was one of the most embarrassing occasions. I gave a very bad lecture on that occasion. Okay, with that, thank you very much and into the topic. Um, this is law and economics has been an area of great interest to me for a long, long time. It began as a researcher um, with my early interest in antitrust legislation. Let me explain a little bit. Antitrust legislation is, is a very major topic in the US uh, because at one level, the global concern with antitrust started in around 1890 with the Sherman Act in the United States. The United States played a very major role. And when I used to do research in industrial organization theory, antitrust law would come up in a very big way. I had a lot of interest and certain things about the way traditional law and economics is done was beginning to trouble me. Occasionally in my different papers, books, I mention about the problems with the Chicago school or the neoclassical school of, develop, uh, of law and economics, but it had to languish there. Despite that interest, I never had time to write, and then I went into the policy world that Satu just mentioned. Three years in India, four years at the World Bank, so seven years, I really had very little time for academic research. But the law problem kept coming to me, back to me, and when I finished my term at the World Bank, my first project was to plunge into this and offload the ideas that I had into a book called The Republic of Beliefs. And that is what I want to talk to you about. It's a methodological work, analytical methodological work, but I think underlying that is a very important urging that we have to look afresh at law and economics, at political economy. And I feel in particular in today's world where politics is going through a very, very dismal phase around the world, and there is some th fundamental rethinking called for, it's a methodological contribution urging us to do some of that rethinking. I'm going to begin by giving you a little bit of my practical world experience where I was encountering the kind of problem which took me into the analytical question which I investigate. To give you a brief history, first of all, of uh, uh, law and economics that interface, 
I'm going to concentrate on the Chicago School, the work of Gary Becker, the work of Coase, then the work of Calabresi, who's from Yale, but that 1960s work is going to be the core. I'll treat that as the traditional approach or the um, um, neoclassical approach to law and economics, and then move away from that. But the early thought in law and economics goes back, like so many things, to the Greeks. Uh, in Athens, there was Solon. Solon made major contributions to, in fact, the interface between law and economics, because there was a lot in Solon's work on trade and trade rules. What kinds of goods should move freely in and out of countries? What kinds of goods should be blocked from entering? And even before Solon, there was Lycurgus in Sparta, who was thinking in terms of laws of interaction between people in trade. The trouble with Lycurgus is Lycurgus did not believe that law should be written down. Law should be completely built into your head and then you live by that. So we don't have enough of Lycurgus' laws in written form. And I'm no expert in this field, but while I was reading on this subject, I discovered that there are some scholars who not only question the existence of Lycurgus' laws, but they question the existence of Lycurgus himself. So he will be put in the sidelines. My focus is going to be the later works that we know much more better on which there is concrete work. But I want to tell you a little bit about my interaction with law and economics as a policymaker, mainly in India, and some of the corruption work continued while I was at the World Bank. During my time in India, um, there was a Right to Food Act that was enacted, but even much before that, India has a scheme of giving food out to poor people, subsidized food. And this, as soon as you look at the system and the way in which it operates in India, it forces you to think about something, in particular, how a law impacts not just ordinary citizens, but the bureaucrats, the functionaries, the enforcers of the law. My entire methodological concern is about that we have ignored the enforcers of the law when we talk about law and economics. This was being driven to me, as, an, as I said, as an academic, I had an early interest, and later on in the policy world, the food is an interesting example. India has a system, as I just said, of distributing food to the poor. The way it works is the following. Every year, India announces a minimum support price for certain basic food grains. This is a price at which farmers have the right to sell to the government. So no one is forced to sell to the government. A price is announced, usually above the market price, to make it attractive. So farmers go and sell the food to the government. Government picks up a lot of wheat and rice. About one third, one fourth of the wheat and rice produced in India is picked up by the government. It's kept in storage. Some of it is kept for redistribution during food shortages and price increases, but some of it is released regularly to poor people. And the way that release is done is poor people have cards identifying themselves as poor, and now in India there is an increasing use of biometric identification. But the poor go to these, there are 500,000 shops all over India run by the government, where cheap food below market price is given to the shopkeeper. And the shopkeeper is told that when poor people come with their card, below market price, the price is fixed, you have to give it to the poor. If you look at this redistribution system, you will discover that over 40% of the food grain collected for this kind of redistribution never reaches the poor. And you can very easily see what happens. Many of these food ration shops get the food from the government below market price, but next to that shop will be a shop being run by, the, by a brother, a free market shop, and you're allowed to run free market shops. Part of the food is diverted to that other shop where it's sold at the market price and profit is made by these stores, whereas the rest goes to the poor who are deprived of a large part. It's a fiscal burden and it's a big leakage. Why does it take place? Because the presumption in government that the bureaucrats, the functionaries of the state will do the job that they are supposed to do. 
and the leakage takes place because they turn out to be rational in ways that is not anticipated by the system. And I will argue that that was indeed a problem with the traditional approach to law and economics. One more encounter which uh, for me became a very harrowing practical uh, engagement with um, uh, law and economics is immediately after I joined the government, I, bribery has been a problem in India and I had gone from the world of not being in the bureaucracy to inside the bureaucracy. And there is one difference which strikes you. When you are in the bureaucracy and senior a part of the government, no one asks you for a bribe. Or very few. If you're really cutting and dealing in big things, you'll be asked for a bribe. But for to get your to do your income tax returns, to get your driving license, they won't dare ask you if you're senior in the government. But if you're outside the government in this everyday life, you are asked for bribes. And since I had moved from outside the government to inside the government, and it was not a lifetime of being in government, I was acutely aware of the problem of bribery. And there was something in the Indian law which troubled me, and I felt that is one reason why bribery is so rampant. The Prevention of Corruption Act 1988 is the main law that tries to control this kind of corruption. And the law has a provision, I won't go into the details, there are exceptions and all that, but for all practical purposes, the Indian law says that in cases of bribery, the bribe giver and the bribe taker are equally criminally liable. So if the bribery case is proved, both will go to jail, both will have to pay a fine, etc. This was troubling me. For one, there was a moral side to it, but that's not the interesting one. The moral side is that many of the bribes that ordinary citizens are asked to pay are not for anything illegal that they are asking for. You've gone for a driving test, you drove perfectly. Before giving you the license, you're told, give me some cash and I'll give you the license. I call those harassment bribes, a bribe which is a pure harassment. But an analytical idea, very elementary game theory struck me and I was quite excited by that. You know, in India, after a bribery takes place and there is investigation, you never get evidence that the bribery had taken place. And the reason is not hard to see. When a bureaucrat asks you for a bribe, you get very angry. But after you've paid the bribe, your interest and the bribe taker's interest are completely unified. You will collude to hide the fact that you've paid a bribe. And it seemed that if you can change, amend India's law, and I had just joined government, I was naive to think these amendments can take place very easily. I thought if you can amend the Indian law and make it for harassment bribes, the bribe giver should be completely free, not punished at all the bribe taker punished and maybe punished double. So giving a harassment bribe is not legal. It's a legal activity. Taking the bribe is illegal. It seemed like such a good idea that I wrote up the paper and posted it on the Ministry of Finance website. <laughs> if I had been in government a bit longer, I never would have done that. But I was new, I thought it's a brilliant idea, we should post it, everyone should see. And there was absolute chaos because there were newspaper op-eds, television uh, um, uh, criticisms, and uh, there was uh, questions raised by members of parliament to the prime minister, uh, saying that I should be asked to leave uh, the government after such an immoral idea being posted uh, on the website. And I actually remember one very uh, tense evening, a very popular television show, in Delhi phoned me up, Barkhadat, who's a very well-known television personality, uh, asking me if I will come on television to debate and explain my idea. And if anyone has watched Indian television debates, you'll know that it is just an one hour of screaming and shouting on uh, the screen. I was feeling I'm ready for that and I did want to explain that my idea was not immoral and in fact it will bring down bribery because once you know that the bribe giver will get up and give evidence against you, you will be hesitant to take the bribe. That was my idea. That make it legal to give harassment bribes, then the bribe taker will not take, knowing that in the next period you will go and tell. So I thought I'll, I will go about explaining this, but I remember that evening I thought I've, I'm giving so much grief to the government that I phoned the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh's, uh, residents and I said, I need to talk to the Prime Minister. Ten minutes later, they called back and the Prime Minister came on the line 
And I told the Prime Minister that I hate to bring you in on this, but I am feeling very tempted to go on a television debate and explain my idea. But since I know members of parliaments have written uh, criticizing my idea, I wanted to see if you are fine with my debating and trying to explain it. The Prime Minister's reaction to me was a very um, um, uh, satisfying reaction in a very curious way. His first remark was, I have seen about your idea in newspapers and indeed people have written to me. I have to say I don't agree with it. But the aim, the purpose of an advisor is to bring ideas to the table, to discuss, to debate, so feel completely free to talk about it and discuss. I had felt very good because after that I remember in a G20 meeting when we were talking, the economic advisors, people in emerging economies were saying that there are very few emerging economies where you'll be given space like that to discuss an idea which is contrary to what the prime minister would support, but bring it in public space and debate. So actually, though I was disappointed that my idea was not getting ground, I felt elated that there was that space for debate and discussion. I, but the time was going completely on policy making. There are some policy makers here who will know, so I had no time to write. It's only when I returned to academics that I began uh, writing. There's a brief thing called Moscow Airport 1992. I don't know if I'll have time to get back to that, but that'll remain. Let me move on. That was one bribery incident. If I have time, I'll come back to that later. On the food grain, I have some data. I just wanted to show you the leakage that takes place on food grain in India. The, um, food that gets diverted and the food that reaches households. And you will see that in 2007-8, uh, 44% of the food was getting diverted, was not reaching the household. That's what I was talking about earlier. Now, the, for the next thing, switch off. Uh, um, uh, um, don't begin to read, but let me just explain. I want to tell you, and this is really the only equation that will come in in the talk, the same thing will be repeated on the next page and then nothing more. But I want to explain that to you because I want to give you the gist of the traditional approach to law and economics, the so-called what I'm calling the Chicago School approach. And don't make a mistake for a moment. I think Gary Becker's work made a huge contribution. It got us thinking, but I think underlying that there is also a very, very deep, very simple flaw once your attention is drawn to it, it's obvious that there is a very deep flaw, which is troublesome. Um, again, as a background, I should tell you that what gets me into this is, in India, you would face very often the criticism and praise that the Indian law is very good on paper, but so often the law is not implemented. It just sits there gathering dust, Ordinary citizens look away from the law as if the law is not there. The police look away from the law as if the law is not there. It's collectively ignored. Why are some laws collectively ignored? Why are some laws enforced? The traditional approach gives you no insight into that or flawed insights into that. The approach I will outline will begin to give you insights into that. But here is the Chicago School, which I want to explain very, very uh, briefly. So start with an entrepreneur who's considering a coal mining venture. And in the beginning, there is no law in the country for or against coal mining. You're allowed to do, it's up to you. How will you decide standard cost benefit analysis? You calculate how much revenue you will generate for yourself through the mining. You will get this much coal, you'll sell it for this price, you'll earn this much. What will be the cost of the mining? You'll have to buy machines, you'll have to get laborers, the cost is C, the revenue is R, R minus C is your profit. If that is positive, you will do coal mining. If that is negative, less than or equal to zero, I assume, you will not do coal mining. Decision taken. Now, bring in a law. A new law is enacted in this country which says that coal mining is illegal. You can't do mining anymore. It pollutes or whatever be the reason, the law says you can't do mining. As a consequence of the law, what happens is, now if you are caught mining, you'll be charged a fine of F dollars. And let's say there is a probability P that you will be caught. So in addition to all these calculations, what you have to do is over and above the cost of mining, you'll have to account for the possibly fine that you'll have to pay. And then you'll see, is it worthwhile for me to do mining or not? And that calculation, which is the gist of uh, Gary Becker's 
um, approach is the following. A new law is enacted, I just told you, declaring mining illegal. If caught, the probability of court being caught is P, you'll be fined F dollars. The venture is now worthwhile if profit, which is R minus C, minus the possible fine that you'll have to pay, which is P multiplied by F, if that is greater than zero, it's worth it. There's so much profit in it that you're willing to take the small risk of being caught and being fined. But if R minus C minus PF is less than or equal to zero, then you will not do mining. That's the gist of the Gary Becker's approach to crime and punishment, famous paper in the 1960s. And this is, as I'm telling you, uh, there are, it's making a contribution because it is immediately forcing you to think in very concrete terms about these, uh, the challenge of crime and punishment. And you're already beginning to get some fascinating insights in this. See, the government to stop corruption, R and C, that's the profit that the person will earn, R minus C. The government controls the probability of catching you by putting out police, jeeps, etc., going around serving, and the size of the fine F. P and F are the two variables that the government uses to control crime. All you want to do is raise P and F sufficiently so that R minus C minus P multiplied by F becomes negative. It's not worthwhile. PF is so big that I'm not going to go around uh, mining. You can do it by raising P or raising F. And there was a lot of early discussion, which the Chicago school's approach drew your attention to, that there are two instruments for controlling um, corruption. Raise the probability of catching someone or raise the fine. Soon it was realized that raising the size of the fine is much cheaper than raising the probability of catching someone. Probability of catching someone, you need lots of jeeps, lots of police, lots of personnel going around serving. So why not raise F, keep P very low? If caught, you'll be fined a massive amount. That runs into other problems, that in poor countries, even the poor and rich countries will very often have a limited liability effectively in place. Beyond the point, I'm not in a position to pay that fine. I'm too poor. So you can't control it just by raising the F. So lots of interesting things came up. There's one important assumption, which I remember when I first encountered these models as a student at LSE, it never even struck me that there is one moral assumption which has been slipped in by the Chicago school, which gives it a lot of power. A fine in the Chicago school approach is no different from a fee. If the government said that you can do mining, but you'll have to pay a fee of F dollars, that and a fine of F dollars are identical. It's the money that you pay. But are they really identical? When there is a new speed limit law saying you can't drive faster than 100 kilometers per hour, and if you do so, we will impose a fine on you do we treat the fine as a price? Is it the same as the government announcing that everyone is free and allowed to drive above 100 kilometers per hour, but you'll have to pay a fee of this much money when you do so or when you're found out doing so? Point is in our heads, that is not the case. We usually think of a fine and a fee in different terms, but right now, I don't want to go into that route. I want to remain neoclassical in that approach. That a fine is an amount of money that goes out of your pocket. Whether that's a fee or a fine, you don't distinguish. So that I will remain with Gary Becker on this. And as I said, this approach did give rise to a lot of very concrete and I think very useful thinking, but also flaws, which meant that in the end, we could not understand why laws are imposed, are enforced in some countries and not enforced and overlooked by everyone. And there is one assumption that has got into the Chicago School approach, which to me is, an, is a contradiction. Two contradictory assumptions are underlying the Chicago School approach. To explain this, and this is the core of my criticism, which leads to the alternate approach, just allow me to elaborate a little bit. The traditional approach to law and economics is when a new law comes in, it's like the game that we are playing in life. That game has changed. In particular, payoffs have changed. From the same action, we get different payoffs. 
And that's the reason why we behave differently. Forget about this uh, coal mining case, take the driving case. It's a very simple case. Earlier, let us say we used to drive when going from here to uh, Turku, we are driving, we would drive at 120 kilometers per hour. But now when a new law comes in saying that you are not allowed to drive above 100 kilometers per hour, let us say that people actually cut down their driving speed. What's the calculation? The Chicago school will tell you the calculation is very easy. If caught, you'll have to pay a huge fine and that we don't want to do. That's why we drop our driving speed. So why are we behaving differently with the new law? Because the payoff function, as we call it in the game theory, has changed. From the same act of driving, earlier I would have got a certain payoff, the delight of reaching early my destination, slight risk of a skid, etc. But now, over and above all that, there is the payoff of a fine that I have to pay. So that changes the payoff from the act of driving fast. And because the payoff has changed, the game has changed, the game that we are playing. And if the game has changed, it's not surprising that we will behave differently. The question that had troubled me when I used to work on antitrust law is the following. What is the law in the end? The law is nothing but a couple of words written down on paper. According to the new law, you're not allowed to drive faster. That's ink on paper. And the question does arise. The game that we are playing in life, the payoffs that we get from our different activities, why will that change? Because someone wrote something down on paper. Why will people's payoffs from driving fast change? Because something was written on paper. The only way to explain that is it changes because the police are expected to go after you and catch you. But of course, that raises another question. Why will the police go after you and try to catch you just because a few words are written down on paper? The Chicago school was getting out of this problem by making an implicit assumption. I don't think they were even aware of that. In thinking of the game of life, they were treating the police, the judge, the magistrate as saintly characters who will automatically do what the law asks them to do. So remember, in Gary Becker's model, you never get a mention of the police going after you, the judge uh, uh, giving a sentence, because they are working automatically behind the scenes. Ordinary citizens are ruthless utility maximizers. The enforcers are, of the law are either robotic creatures or saintly creatures who do what they are supposed to do. But that is an inconsistency, two sets of people being described completely differently. If you take the Chicago school all the way and treat the police, the judge, the prime minister, the minister, everyone as individuals with whatever they are maximizing, maximizing that, and write the full game with all of them as players, indeed the law is just some ink on paper. The game does not change. After you drive fast, if the police says, well, I won't go after this person, and the head of the police department says that I will not punish the police person who does not enforce the law. And the judge says I will not punish the head of the police department. If everyone looks the other way, then it is as if the law does not exist on paper. And in a lot of emerging economies, developing countries, that is indeed the case. The law is there on paper and not enforced. And uh, a very similar line as I take in my paper is taken by a uh, Melath, George Melath, Steve Morris, and Andy Postlewaite, and they give lots of examples from American law, which is there on paper, but no one enforces that. Everyone looks the other way. So there are laws that people collectively look the other way, and that raises the very, very big question, why are some laws enforced? I am going to um, skip over, I'm not going to go into the prisoner's dilemma at all. I'm going to leave you over there on the PowerPoint and explain why the law could be making a difference. If the law, now here is the other side of the question, if it is true that law is nothing but some sentences written down on paper and that can't change the game that we are playing, the question does arise. After all, laws do make a difference. In Finland, if you bring in a new speed limit law, it's almost without doubt it'll change the speed at which people are driving in the roads. How come the law does make a difference if it is just some ink on paper? There seems to me just only one way out to explain this. The law makes a difference because after a law is enacted, 
we change our beliefs about one another's beliefs and behavior. So the law has nothing more in bricks and mortar and concrete than our beliefs about one another. It's what I believe the other person, the police will do, and the police believes what the judge will do to the police, and it's our collective beliefs which can change when a new law comes in, and that's the only way in which the law influences behavior. It sounds extremely vacuous, but it can be made concrete, it can be put to use. The reason I felt emboldened by this is because my favorite philosopher uh, in the middle of the 18th century took a very, very simple, similar line. And took a similar line in a somewhat inchoate way because he didn't have the modern methodology of economics of game theory to write it more concretely. This is David Hume. David Hume, in his essay on government, and even before that 1739 treatise on human nature, broods about in passages very beautifully. I, I can't say this so nicely that how come the dictator or the leader of a country is so powerful? It can't be because of that person's muscle and physical power. What can a single individual do? In the end, the power of that person comes from nothing else but one another's beliefs about what we will do to one another. That is what gives power to a dictator. And at one level, there is this philosophical background of David Hume, and I think Hume really is very close to that, but he did, doesn't have the wherewithal of modern theory, which I'm going to bring into this just now. But also, if you read Kafka and Kafka's trial, which is the invisible hand going sour. It is not Adam Smith's benevolent invisible hand. It's an invisible hand which is oppressive. But where is it coming from? Everyone, the enforcers of the law who come and arrest Joseph K. It's not clear that they are getting orders from anywhere. In fact, it remains a mystery that it's such a powerful force in society oppressing individuals. Where it comes from is not clear. And it's a very troubling tri trial to me. It's one of the most troubling pieces of literature that it is an invisible hand at work. It's one another's beliefs that make us behave in a certain way. And Kafka himself must have been very troubled by having written the trial because it was never published in his lifetime. It was in 1925, one year after his death, that his friend Max Broad published it. And it's telling the same story. But Hume, as an analytical philosopher, is giving you some of the analytics of this. But this can be made concrete, and I'm going to try to persuade you that it can be made concrete. The line I'm taking, there is a small group of people who take similar line. I just mentioned that economists, uh, uh, George Melath, Steve Morris, Andy Postelbate, there are legal scholars like Cass Sunstein, Eric Posner, um, Richard McAdams, who take similar views. And I'm going to give it now a more concrete shape with a little bit of very, very elementary game theory. And the game theory that I will use is a two-liner. It's this game called the squares game. And I'll show you the power of just belief. Nothing will cha be changed about the rule of this game. But I'll change something about your belief about other people's beliefs, and behavior is going to change. This game is played as follows. There are 16 squares. Each of you will have to, assume it's a two-player game. Each of you will have to choose a square. If you choose the same square, you get $100. If you choose different squares, you get nothing. So in this game, you're desperate to choose what the other person chooses. If I literally give you this and ask you to choose a square, I've done this in classrooms, it'll be all over the place. People choose, the corners do get chosen. People hope that there will be a sort of, others will choose that, but it's all over. The corners have a little bit more. People don't manage to coordinate. This game, the squares game is a very, very simple game. So once again, because I'm going to just add something to that, you choose a square, and once you've chosen the square, I'll open it up. If you and the other person choose the same square, you get $100, otherwise you get nothing. I won't change the game, but the board I'm going to change because I didn't have a better board. It's a bad board because one of those squares has a gold color, but please ignore that. It's nothing but a little bit of paint on a square. Uh, now you have to choose a square, and after you've chosen the square, if both of you choose the same square, you'll get $100 each. If you choose different squares, you will get nothing. If you play this game, virtually everyone will choose the golden square. 
that little bit of painting on the square, which does not change the game, changes behavior. And I do believe that in the end, the law, even dictatorships, no matter how oppressive they look, and I will talk a little bit about an old topic of mine later, Václav Havel's work, where he takes from Kafka, his fellow countryman, and develops it. Some of the worst forms of power are nothing but one another's belief about one another's behavior. And that's what locks us in into situations. That's the secret of successful laws. That's also the secret of dreadful dictatorships. And I should also point out that there are lots of practical uses that the focal point are already being put to, um, 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 made um, in real life applied. One of the best examples is when I had first encountered, and that time there was no discussion of focal points, I was not even aware. Airports, when you try to meet someone, often it happens if you haven't specified exactly where you will meet that person, you're looking around for your friend and not finding that person. This was solved in airports. I first saw it in Heathrow, but I don't know where it first happened. In the middle of somewhere, you just put up a sign saying meeting point. That is nothing. It doesn't change the game. You're meeting someone, you can go anywhere to meet that person. But having that sign there is like having that gold painted square. You know that the other person knows that you will go there and wait for that person under the meeting point sign. And it works. Life is full of that and I think much more on that than we believe. And the discipline of law and economics is indeed an example of that. And now comes the question, why are laws better implemented and worse implemented? I have lots of concrete examples, but I won't have time really to go into that. Um, um, let me keep it just to analytics. I will uh, come back to this in a moment. There are many reasons why laws are um, enforced well and not enforced well. One is you must collectively know that the law is trying to get you to coordinate behavior. So a law-abiding society is nothing but a society that has learned to recognize one another's beliefs. You can go through life where you're not a law-abiding society because your belief is so deeply entrenched that others do not enforce, the, no one, everyone looks away from the law that you don't enforce that law. There's this beautiful quotation attributed to, sorry, 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 beautiful quotation attributed to Gordon Brown. Um, Gordon Brown is supposed to have said, in establishing the rule of law, the first five centuries are always the hardest. So it takes a very long time. This has, by the way, it's, we've never discovered whether Gordon Brown actually said it or not. We haven't seen a quote by him, but it's such a beautiful quote that it needs only a little bit of rationality on the part of Gordon Brown not to get up and say that I didn't say it. So he has kept quiet on that. We don't know whether he actually said it or, or not. Now, so first of all, we must recognize our collective beliefs. Number two, if the law is trying to push you to outcomes which are not an equilibrium, such a law will not be followed. If the laws are so numerous that you will have to violate the law, that also becomes a reason why violating laws become a norm and many emerging economies, laws are so complex and laws are so all encompassing that in the end you violate laws and that becomes a part of life. There is by the way a subtle political economy over here that you must keep in mind because of my interest in developing countries, emerging economies, this troubles me. Many countries, it is in the interest of political leaders to have such complicated laws that everyone violates some law. And this is a risk that China faces, a risk that India faces, that Brazil faces. When the law is so complicated that everyone violates a law, it gives the leader a huge power. After you declare that I'm going to go on a no corruption campaign, catch people who are violating the law, you immediately get a choice of who you catch. If everyone is violating some law, you can catch your friends, you can catch your enemies, you can catch newspapers that criticize you because everyone has indeed violated some law. And of course, if you are politically a bit savvy, you realize that catching your friends first will mean you'll be out of power in no time. So even if you're serious to start with, 
the president or the prime minister that I want to banish corruption. In a country where everyone is forced to violate some law, trivial law, that becomes an instrument as to who you go after. You go after your opposition, and what began as a genuine anti-corruption move becomes an instrument for oppression of the press, of the media, of democracy. And we do see this around the world. It makes a folly of what the law is, and in addition, it does a lot of damage to democracy. And then, something very concrete over here, Another reason why some laws, don't, laws very often do not get enforced have to do with multiple focal points. You see, a focal point is very, very effective if there is only one focal point. If you try to create more, you will run into difficulties, and I can show you the example of this. Suppose a norm develops that everyone chooses the gold um, uh, um, box and you do, in the game you win, and you get $100 each. There may be a few people who misunderstand that, choose some other point. That's the convention. And now let us say, I declare a new rule. I say that the square marked green should be, I get up on the podium and say, everyone should choose that, that way you will all get the same square, and you will make money. Will that work? It's not very clear. Because you're, you're not trying to take my word for it. You're trying to guess what others will do. If you're all used to choosing the golden square and get the $100, after the new rule is declared, you will begin to wonder, will others also switch to green or will they stay with gold? And in fact, after you declared this new target green, actually the game behavior in the game may worsen because coordination can break down. Some people going for the gold, some people going for the green. There are examples in economics where that's not the explanation that people are giving, but I feel beneath the surface that is indeed the explanation. And here is an example. Um, in India, the British in 1819 in the Bombay Deccan were very, very troubled by India's credit markets, the usury practices. There was a lot of defaulting. People would give money and then the repayment would not take place. Also, there was a lot of forced repayment. You've gone completely broke, you're beaten up, and you're forced to repay. So the credit market did not work well. Rachel Cranton and Anand Swamy have a very lovely paper in um, Journal of Development Economics where they get a lot of historical documents, and then they study what the British, the British brought in civil courts and a unified law for how people should behave in the credit market. And they wanted to see how effective the law was. And what they discovered was actually the law made things worse. Somehow the credit market was malfunctioning after that for about the uh, 20 years that they studied. And they gave a whole lot of reasons that it was not well drafted, it was not complete, the law had problems. But I have another uh, explanation. In the absence of the law, people still had rules. And the rules were like that golden square. People had learned that that is what others will expect for me, this is how I will behave. Those norms were in place. When the law comes in, it's like another focal point in the game, saying change your behaviors. This is what we expect of you. If you have two focal points, the chance of the focal points achieving much goes down. And initially what you're seeing when you bring the rule of law in a society where the local norms, the social norms are very strong, you get malfunctioning taking place of behavior because the law actually breaks down the coordination. Even if it was poor coordination, there was some coordination, and that breaks down once you bring in the new law. And in a lot of societies with the end of the colonial period, when you are bringing in laws that, the, in fact, your colonial rulers left behind, you are getting a conflict between existing norms and new laws that have been uh, brought into society, and people begin to violate the law. And very often, that indeed becomes the violation, becomes the norm. I want to just give you a few real life examples of the power of beliefs in guiding one another's um, behavior, and then tell you a little bit about where the agenda is once you treat the law as nothing more than something that changes the belief of the police, the prime minister, the magistrate, and ordinary citizens. And that's the only way in which a law becomes effective. That approach, where do you take? How do you make it richer and make it practical? I'll talk a little bit about the future. But I want to give you a little bit by way of examples. 
in life. The first, which was for me, uh, got me into the subject in a big way was Václav Havel's work, which drew me into this subject. And that time I did not have any interest in game theory, so I did not do any game theoretic formalization, but my new book, The Republic of Beliefs, has Václav Havel being written up formally as a game, and it shows that actually the idea that Havel talks about, the idea that was there in David Hume, can be given very, very formal structure. And the idea that Havel talks about was, is interesting. I first encountered this uh, when uh, this was just after I had become an economist teaching in Delhi school, I was visiting uh, Amartya Sen in Oxford. And uh, at a dinner, I sat next to Stephen Luke. Stephen Luke had written a very beautiful book called Power, The Third Dimension. And he started chatting. And he asked me about Václav Havel, about whom I knew nothing, I have to say, at that time. He said, if you're interested in political power, then there is a document I can give you, which is something that Havel wrote when under imprisonment, and it has been smuggled out of Czechoslovakia. And Luke, uh, Stephen Luke was writing an introduction, Luke was writing an introduction to that piece. It's called The Power of the Powerless. And um, Havel wrote most of it when he was in his uh, uh, um, rural home in Radecek. I may be mispronouncing that. He used to write that with a tower just outside his house where these people at the tower kept 24 hours of him under observation. And it was Havel's philosophy that in the end, the person who is observing is like Václav Havel, just another citizen, because the observer believes that someone else is observing, whether the observer is observing, the observer does his job. So Havel was actually very kind to the observer, occasionally inviting him to come and have tea with him in his home. In that setting, he writes this description of an oppressive dictatorship. And the more you think about it, all dictatorships are rooted in this. And Havel's question is the following. People, ordinary greengrocers who put up signboards declaring loyalty to the oppressive dictatorship, are they really loyal to the dictatorship? And Havel's answer is no, they are not loyal. They are pretending loyalty. Why are they pretending loyalty? because they are worried if they don't put up a poster and pretend loyalty, then party bosses and others, bureaucrats will begin to harass this person for not being loyal to this dreadful dictatorship. We know that. People very often do that. You pretend loyalty because you're scared. But Havel goes on to ask the second layer question, which is a much deeper question. Why will those party bosses, why will those state functionaries harass someone if that person is found to be disloyal, Havel says the answer is the same. That person believes that if I don't harass someone who is visibly disloyal, others will harass me. And so in the end, we begin to mimic a sense of loyalty. And he says, you can be caught from the president to the ordinary citizens, all mimicking because we are scared of each other. And it gets you into this trap. Dictatorships are nothing but a trap where we believe one another and we are scared of one another and we begin to behave in a certain way. And it has nothing to do, yes, he's talking of that time of uh, uh, what came from Russia, oppression in Czechoslovakia, but this can happen in any country. The fascinating example of this in a complete free society is the McCarthy period in the United States. McCarthyism starts in 1950. Senator McCarthy goes to a women's Republican club in Wheeling, Virginia, and pulls out a sheet of paper from his pocket and says that I have a list here of 205 communist sympathizers or communists and un-American people who are a part of the State Department. And we have to go after these people. This movement gradually picks up. We know that there were absolutely top scientists, music composers, filmmakers, who are all being described as un-American, communist sympathizers, and charged of being un-American and communists. Point is, McCarthyism took place without the law being changed at all. No law was brought in for the McCarthy period. But people started behaving in a certain fashion, which shows in the end what a law does 
The absence of a law can do if you all expect one another to behave in a certain way. And the McCarthy period is a great example. When someone is charged of being a communist sympathizer and un-American, and that person is in the film industry with you, you know that person very well, you think that's a complete false charge. If you get up and say that, no, that's a false charge. That person is not un-American. Others will nod and say, oh, I see, you're covering up for that person. You are also un-American. And you get locked into one another's belief. And so the few people who are being arrested and troubled, no one gets up. No one gets up and says that, no, you're doing that wrongly because it's a collective belief that you are trapped into. And that is once again the belief that at times can be put to very good uses, like the law, and at times it becomes a belief that traps you. And I feel there are periods in India, the emergency period, 1975 to 77, I had colleagues at the Delhi School of Economics and elsewhere that remained loyal to the, that, period, that period and the emergency and the dictatorship that came for a two-year period, but it was there. I feel it's very similar, not that they believed in it, but you have got into a trap that you can't get out of. Where do we go from here? Where do we take this further forward? Uh, what we do need to build in, once you recognize that the Chicago School approach where you take half the population as optimizers going after something and the rest as robotic enforcers, once you drop that and treat all human beings as similarly modeled with similar objectives, you get another more complicated approach, it's almost a bit like moving from partial equilibrium analysis to general equilibrium analysis. Harder to do because everyone is a player, everyone's motivation is there. Harder to write up models, but actually you can do that. I, I have written up models where you take everyone as a part of the game and the law begins to play a role. But the next step ought to be bring in a bit more realism about human motivation. So first of all, you must not treat two sets of human beings as totally different as the Chicago school did. That is wrong. But once you treat human beings as across the board similar, you have to allow for human psychology, human foibles, and a lot of behavioral economics does that. Towards the end of the book, I talk about bringing behavioral economics into law and economics. It's a tentative approach. I want to give you uh, Finn, an another 10 minutes. Is, uh, Satu, another 10 minutes is OK? Yeah. So I can give you some examples of once you begin to bring human psychology into the picture, uh, how does the whole exercise uh, of law and economics change? I don't have final answers. These are speculative uh, discussions. But I think it is important to bring in because to get to a richer analysis, you do need what I call is the focal point approach to law, which is the name of the kind of approach I'm describing. But it should be a focal point approach to law with behavioral features where you are treating human beings more realistically than what we traditionally do in economics. And that's what I want to touch about recently, a little bit of my recent interest over here. Behavioral economics is basically incorporating psychology uh, into uh, human behavior, uh, systematic irrationalities. And one particular thing which I have ever since I've started thinking about it, I'm more and more gripped that it is an important idea. Created targets. In life, we have lots of targets and objectives that get created during the course of life, and the power of that I will come to in a moment. But that the human mind is susceptible to being deluded is extremely important. And I've just taken one picture from the World Development Report, Mind, Society, and Behavior, which to me illustrates this just very, very beautifully. This one, I find it totally baffling. Let me explain this for one moment. This uh, uh, so, sort of checkerboard has one square marked A. Can you see the A? Is it? Yeah. And one marked B. That A and B, the two squares, which square is a darker shade? A, I mean, uh, uh, there may be a few people who see it otherwise, but A is just very, very distinctly darker. I treat myself as rational, so I keep focusing and saying that I must see this very clearly. But it's amazing. They are identical, A and B. Our eyes pick up the surrounding area. What I'm going to do next is take this. Because this is, by the way, was done by Edward Adelson at MIT, developed this. What I'm going to do, and I, I needed a research assistant to do that, is to remove everything else from the board, excepting the squares A and B. 
They are identical. But as soon as you have the surrounding pictures, your mind finds it almost impossible to shake that off. You see them differently. This is just plain simple perception. And you can see therefore that when it comes to rationality, when it comes to rational choice, we must be making lots of systematic mistakes. And in that, those mistakes often lie despair and there can often be hope in those mistakes is that there can be individuals who decide that certain kinds of behavior are just moral. I will not behave otherwise because that's the right way to behave. These traits as they develop in society, you begin to get better behavior, better kinds of coordination becomes possible as these traits come into play. But where do these, where do these traits come from? How come they are with us? We don't know enough because this is all very new in economics. What interests me is created targets. Created target is, in standard economics, we start by saying that we all like apples, oranges, shirts, and houses. You draw indifference curves and you do maximization. Firms and entrepreneurs like profits and you like profits because you want to buy those things and that's why you maximize profits. But once you look around life a bit dispassionately, you'll see hundreds and thousands of human behavior where you're not going after guns and butter and shoes and clothes, but you're still struggling and trying to do, going after that target. One very good example is, on a flat surface, use three bars to put up two vertically and one horizontally. So you get a gate-like area and get another one at a gate-like area at the other end put a ball in the middle and gradually get people trying to, one group of people to put a ball through that, that, that gate and another group trying to put a ball through this gate. It's called soccer or football. After some time, these people are willing to get hurt, falling down, trying to get the ball in through that goalpost and another group trying to get it through this goalpost. And that becomes their obsession. They are not doing this to win uh, money, then to buy more guns and butter. That itself is their target. And not only that, when different groups begin to do that, people become supporters. Someone supports Manchester United, someone supports Arsenal. And you're then desperate for Manchester United to win, and our other group is desperate for Arsenal to win. And you don't want Manchester United to win because that will give you more clothes, you'll be better off. That is your target. You just want Manchester United to win. Ravi Kanbur yesterday was saying that that's been his mindset for a long time, for Manchester <laughs> United to win. Now, when in, if we bring it into real life, many supporters of Donald Trump, we try to say that, are they making a mistake? That by bringing Trump in, they think that they'll be better off, there'll be more benefits for the poor. How do you explain that? I feel that's the wrong way to look at it. Supporting Trump for many has become exactly like supporting Manchester United. Nothing else matters, but you want your team to win. You don't want the other side to win. And I feel this is just very, very powerful. When your identity is so totally, you're just cheering. You don't say that, oh, the Manchester United player kicked the ball in this manner. From now on, I'm switching over to Arsenal. You don't say that. You are completely tied up with that target. And that's what has happened in politics now. With the extreme right and the extreme left, what very often happens is that becomes the team you're supporting. And you're not supporting that for anything else. That is your created objective and you're going after that. And life is full of that. A lot of patriotism where you're willing to give up your life, a lot of things, whether you call it good or bad, a lot of human motivation, you can actually get people energized about that being the target. Some of the most successful corporate leaders don't give you financial benefits, but gradually motivate you that running this corporate this corporation, get, getting it to be the top corporation is your objective. It is your supporting Manchester United. And it's a very cheap policy once you get that mindset in place because these people are working very, very hard to get that done. And indeed, in, even in governments, you can put this to good use. If the government servants, those who are distributing the cheap food, those who are doing all these jobs, they are told that take pride in that. That is what you're supposed to do. That's possible. And we have to understand why in some societies you manage to inculcate those values, why in other societies you don't manage to inculcate values. This standard view that bureaucrats increase their salaries and they will behave better 
Yes, there may be some cases where that is the case, but I'll tell you in a lot of developing countries I've, I've worked in one, salaries are pretty decent for bureaucrats. It's not that they are trying to make up for that by taking the bribe. It is they don't take enough pride in the work that they do. And that plays a very, very important role. And you do want to bring that and mesh it into today's world. I'm going to just talk a little bit about globalization and the problems that that is causing, and then stop with that, because I do want to take in some uh, questions and answers. Globalization is, I think, at the base of a lot of the problem that we are seeing in the world today. The world politics has turned nasty. In a quiet way, it's not war, but it is beneath the surface. It's just boiling across the world. And I feel one of the reasons for that is globalization, the people coming together. And some of the clue lies in people with different morals and different expectations coming together does cause a kind of conflict. Being upset with globalization is globalization good or bad? I find that debate actually a completely moribund debate, a pointless debate. Globalization is not being done by anyone individually, being uh, deliberately brought into place. Globalization is the outcome of innovation and technology, little bits of improvements in technology taking place over a long period of time. Globalization is a bit like gravity. You don't have a debate on is gravity good for us or is gravity bad for us? You can have that debate, it's a completely useless debate because gravity will be there anyway. Likewise, you do not spend too much time about how to do away with gravity. It may be possible in some ways, but it's too expensive, too difficult. Globalization is a bit like that. It's a part of life, we have to live with it. What problem is it causing? I feel it is bringing people together. At times through electronic groups, you're talking to people across the board in the country. At times through just the flow of people, you are seeing a conflict in styles. And conflict in styles is very, very difficult. When you say that allow people to practice different religions, and I firmly believe in that, you should give individuals the full freedom to practice their own religions, including atheism, if you want to believe in that and want to practice that, that's your personal belief. But you can also see that if you different groups of people come together with some fundamental differences, you will have to try to sort them out. And an example is, suppose on one island, people drive cars and they've developed a very good convention you drive on the left. Everyone drives on the left. There are virtually no accidents. It's all smooth. There's another island where the convention develops. You drive on the right. Everyone drives on the right. Very few accidents to take place. Now, both these sets of people move to a common island. One set is used to driving on the left. The other set is used to driving on the right. You will have to adopt one rule in this society. And that can cause a huge amount of conflict. I feel we have to face up to the fact that as the world comes together, people of different kinds come together, there will be these conflicts of norms that they were used to, but you've come into a pool where the norms, a whole lot of people follow other norms. I feel we have to sit down, we have to talk, and we have to think in terms of norms of society at a global level. The way to do this is think of certain minimum global constitution. Stephen Breyer, the uh, uh, one-time Supreme Court judge, assistant Supreme Court judge, in the beautiful book talks about statutist provisions in Italy in the 14th century. Little bits of conflict that would take place when a Roman citizen goes to Florence and has a fight where there's some Roman law and the uh, law of Florence comes into conflict. You have statutes to deal with those kinds of problems. That's happening in the world in a big way. We need to have, a, to me, a minimum global agreement that we have to go by a couple of rules which are common rules. Beyond that, we have to then develop these rules. It's going to be hard. I'm not 100% sure that we will manage that. If we don't manage, then civilization, as we know, will probably come to an end. After all, there are big civilizations in history which have come to an end because they did not manage to deal with many of the problems that they confronted. But we are probably the first creatures on Earth. Unlike the dinosaur, the dinosaur was about to perish, but the dinosaur had no ability to analyze their own predicament. We are dinosaurs who have the ability to analyze our own predicament. And so we should say that these traits of ours that are leading to greater and greater conflict are traits that we have to sit down 
work together and we don't want to go towards extinction. We want to develop rules that we collectively live together. Globalization is taking place at a pace where we are coming together faster than we had anticipated and these rules and laws that we live by within individual societies are coming into conflict and coming into conflict in all kinds of very, very complex ways by people moving in and out of places to electronic linkages. We have to work on that. And the belief that there is a leader who can impose that, which is the original Hobbesian view, Leviathan does it, is false. Hobbes was making the same mistake that the neoclassical approach to law and economics makes, thinking that there are some people who are the ultimate guardians. In the end, it is all on our hands. In our hands, it is to do with our beliefs. And we have to sit down, work together to develop certain minimum codes of behavior from where we can start out once again. And since in the end, life is nothing but just a collectivity of beliefs, beliefs about one another, which influences our behavior, that is where we have to understand the modality of that and work towards using that better to develop collective global rules. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, in your theory of mutually reinforcing beliefs, how do you explain then that Sorry. laws change if individuals do not stop or choose to stop believing in them? Uh, say, can you repeat that once again? How do laws change if individuals choose not to stop believing in them? Yeah. One of the reasons, this is the Gordon Brown quote. If you live in a society where the belief has come in, whatever is the new law, that's the one that you f um, uh, follow. Once that is in place, that's a collective belief. As long as the law is taking you towards a behavior that is a consistent behavior, that kicks in very quickly. But if you live in a society where you've learned to ignore the law, then when a law is announced, it's a part of your belief, so it's not very clear that that's going to happen. So the understanding of that is not that you put in more policemen to go after that because someone needs to police the policemen as well, which is, in fact, David Hume has exact descriptions of that, the problem of policing the police. So there are no guarantees that it'll come in, but to understand that in the end it is these beliefs that uh, will do it instead of bringing in a greater bureaucracy, a heavier hand of the bureaucracy to enforce behavior is the starting point. Yeah. Deepak, for the people at the back, you may want to use the mic. Yeah. Um, in what sense, if any, is your idea of collective beliefs that lead to the acceptance of laws or observance of laws different from Adam Smith's ideas of social norms uh, that actually yeah. make market economies work? Uh, a second aside that I cannot resist on Gary Becker and the Chicago School because apart from uh, misunderstanding human behavior or questions of morality, it has no sense of history because just a quarter of a century earlier, you had prohibition in Chicago. Uh, and yet that law was not observed by anyone, uh, police, judges, mayors, governments. So isn't the, the absence of history in the Chicago school a major analytical flaw? Uh, Deepak, I'm glad you asked about norms and law. In fact, a large part of my work discusses the two. And the line I take, you may not be surprised after the full lecture, is fundamentally there is no difference between the two. A norm is my expectation of if I don't do something, how others will react. And others will react because their expectation of how others will react. And the law, though that is not widely recognized, that's the line I'm taking, in the end the law is the same. It is that the other person who will react is called a functionary of the state. In norm, usually the, the only difference is, and I do go into this, is we have a label for the ones whose behavior makes me behave well. It's a functionary of the state. It's the police, what the police will do. In the norm, it is what a cousin of mine will do towards me that makes me behave in a certain way. But the cousin's behavior and the police's behavior is in the end, it's the same. The police would behave in that way because the police are worried about the head of the police department, how that person will treat the police. So in the end, it's the same, but in one set, it is the functionaries of the state who you're looking at. In another case, you're looking at others, but it's the same. And there are cases like India's caste norms are almost like a law. I mean, it's just 
oppressive for individuals. It comes down on you. And the line that George Akerlof had taken, that there are many of the caste, uh, uh, law, uh, caste behavior in India, which no one wants to follow, but everyone is in a trap. I behave in this way because someone else is watching me, someone else behaves in that way because that person is being watched by someone else, and that's the same. So in the end, it is similar, and the norms, the way norms are understood is the way that laws have to be understood. And I have a discussion of one particular norm, which I've talked about a lot and written about a lot, is the punctuality norm. Is, uh, it's to do with one another's expectations of behavior, and that can be modeled very beautifully, how I two identical sets of people, one set is, very punctual, the other set is not punctual at all. Fundamentally, they are identical. They've just hit upon that focal point, one group, and the other group has not. So, very similar. Now, the history and this is, yes, that is a lacking in the Chicago school, but I'm a bit generous about that because that's a lacking in sort of across the board in economics. And to me, the focal point approach is one link between historical approaches and the Contemporary behavior of human beings, that's the analytical tool that links it up. Because one thing I remember very beautifully is when um, 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 Thomas Schelling discussed a focal point and said, you and your friend have decided to meet in New York and uh, you haven't fixed a place as to where you will meet, and, but you fixed the time at 12 o'clock. Where will you go and wait for your friend? And apparently New Yorkers disproportionate number would go to Grand Central those days and wait over there. I remember in India, in Delhi School of Economics, people who have never come to the US, I had given this question in class. It was Empire State Building, where they were all going. So people sort of collective common history, which we carry in our heads, have a huge influence on our behavior. And yes, the first of all is to make room for the fact that these beliefs play a role, and then you begin to link it up. One reason why economists go very light on this is economists like to, and we, we are in this, we know we want to then give it a formal structure. And there was a belief that history is very difficult to capture in a formal structure. I believe that actually, if you're not obsessed with writing differential equations, analytically there's a lot of scope for bringing history into our analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tony Obin from Ghana. I was just wondering how you explain resistance to enforcement. I mean, when there's a collective resist resistance to enforcement, a law has been made, government wants to, to, to enforce it, but there's a collective resistance, and oftentimes the resistors succeed. Yeah. This is a very difficult question, and Havel's essay, not surprisingly, goes into this. If you are all in a trap, you're being oppressed, and you're in a bad equilibrium, why shouldn't you collectively resist this force on you? The question, of course, is you can see why it's difficult, is that even if all of you realize that all of you are being oppressed by the regime, the first person who gets up to say that why don't we all get up and protest and break out of it, that person is likely to be caught and harassed by others for fear that if you don't put down someone who's trying to cause this resistance, you will have a breakdown. Usually resistances happen when you have a few irrational people who are willing to take disproportionate cost on themselves but stand up and say that, look, this foolishness must not continue. Gandhi is an example of an irrational individual who gets up and says that, look, no matter what happens to me, this is it, you want to put an end to that. Nelson Mandela is an irrational uh, person. In the end, very often the resistance originates from a few irrational human beings who irrational in the, in the sense of economics, uh, I'm using it, who are willing to stand up. And if you are standing up for a cause where a lot has built up, then usually these uprisings happen with a critical change. So for a long time, everyone mimics loyalty, and then it suddenly breaks down dramatically. There is a very, very beautiful early book I had read about uh, um, Kapuscinski's book about Heil Selassie that loyalty to Heil Selassie was total, and Kapuscinski is just describing it. He, there's no, nothing more analytical. Then after the fall of Selassie, people who are completely loyal to Selassie seemed like they were loving their job, immediately vanished and disappeared, and they started showing their other preferences. So very often loyalty, which looks like ironclad, could have broken down beneath the surface. You need a few people to lead that, 
where that comes from, or do we always have to rely, rely on a few irrational people? Maybe so. But I feel also just having the clarity that you can get into equilibrium of everyone mimicking loyalty with no one being loyal. Just these understandings very often give us some ways to think in terms of how we get out of that. But I don't have an easy solution how you do that resistance moves. There's a couple of hands there at the back, I can see. Uh, Andrea Cornia from the University of Florence. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder if you looked into the issue of uh, uh, formal and informal legal norms. I mean, in most countries, uh, I mean, if you, if you take the economic area, for instance, there are written norms. People should abide to them. I mean, and this is the focus of your own lecture. But the, these norms are often um, misplaced. And uh, you do find that the uh, society develops norms which are actually much more efficient and fair. And so the question is that who, who produces the norm? The parliament? The parliament... Uh, from a political economic perspective, reflects the interest of the elites uh, quite often. And uh, <clears throat> in this case, society reacts in, uh, in a way, coming up with uh, norms which are more reasonable. So which one, which norm should be followed in this case? And the last example, now in Florence, I live in Florence, there are many, I mean, it's a medieval, sorry, sorry, it's a Renaissance town, I mean, and there are many, many narrow streets, one way. Uh, is, is the reign of one-way street. Now, people behave in this way. If uh, another car comes in the opposite direction, they protest and they call the police. If a moped does the same, the same. But if a bike comes in the opposite direction and it tries to stay on the thing. This, I mean, the public behavior is that you should try to accommodate this person. This is against the law, but people, they find it is much more useful because uh, I mean, otherwise, this poor cyclist should, should go around the city to go from uh, one place to another. So, so what is the, the interaction between formal and informal norms? Because, I mean, why should I obey a formal norm that uh, basically is wrong? It seems that you started out saying that the norms are, the laws are good. Sometimes they're not. Sure. Andrea, thank you very much. Um, since my work is a methodological one, first of all, the thing underlying that before I get into this is at a very, very fundamental level, informal laws and formal laws are the same. I mean, that is the line that I'm taking. In the end, it is our expectations of other people's behavior, their beliefs, which make us behave in a certain way. That's true of informal laws. That's true of formal laws. And we indeed know, I mean, uh, um, there are uh, cases, anthropological writings, I'm thinking of Max Gluckman on the Barotse, examples where informal laws actually can look very much like formal laws because they are just so well enforced. And Indian caste laws, they are breaking down now, but historically, they look very much like formal laws. So beneath the surface, there is indeed this commonness that in the end, it's not someone at the top who does it. That was the Hobbesian mistake that has come down to us till today. In the end, it is we, even formal laws, it is nothing but that. In one case, there are the functionaries of the state involved, but the functionaries of the state are also individuals who are going about their chores. That needs to be recognized, and then you analyze formal laws and informal laws. It's interesting, I also, uh, uh, crossing the road in the United States, I very often notice that the kind of example you're giving how people make sort of rational corrections to the law. One difference between crossing the road in Japan and crossing the road in United States is pedestrian crossings are respected, but in Japan they are respected even when there is no car nowhere on site. You wait till the light changes. In the United States, I treat it as a rational violation of the law, that if you're saying no car, nowhere, you just uh, uh, walk a bit briskly across. But if there is a car, it sort of treat it as a yield sign rather than as a stop sign is the way pedestrians do. Some of those actually, ideally, you want a world where the laws are there, but society becomes so sophisticated that they violate the laws just in the way in which it's optimal to do so, which is difficult to write down. How do you get to that? I don't know, but again, you want to get, get there. Um, in the end, we have to analyze formal laws by using the same instruments that we used to analyze informal laws. That is the line that I'm taking. And how does it become stronger in one country 
there's history involved. We will probably never get to full answers of that. But the belief that it is top down, it's the government bureaucracy which does it, I think has done us a lot of harm in understanding the implementation of the law. And it does did frustrate me in India when I worked as a policymaker to see so many laws so wildly being violated. And every time you see that, you think of bringing in one more layer of bureaucracy to go after that. But that becomes useless because there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what enforces the law.